because ZCLA wasn't the only Zen center that had problems with clergy misconduct. Every major Zen center headed by a Japanese teacher, so this is San Francisco Zen Center. Suzuki Roshi was not involved, but his successor, Baker Roshi, was. So there was the same issues there. And um, Milwaukee, Zen Center in Milwaukee, Kataguri Roshi, and then Edo Shimano back east, and also Suzaki Roshi. So, and then, then some of the other Buddhist centers, uh, like Insight Meditation Center, they've had issues there, Spirit Rock, and so on. So it's a, it's a generalized problem. It's not a one place has a problem and every place else is sacred. It's a human problem. Uh, because some of the uh, Zen centers needed, needed help, or Buddhist centers needed help, the Buddhist Peace Fellowship produced a little booklet called Safe Harbor, which is ethical guidelines and recommended policies or sample policies and procedures for ethical guidelines. And that's downstairs, and I wrote a piece on that. And then I had been putting together a piece on what the Buddhists taught about sexual harassment when the Bill Clinton and Monica Lewinsky affair came out. And so I just sent it to Tricycle, and they said, oh, good, we needed something. We, had, we felt like we couldn't be silent on this issue. So that was published in Tricycle at that, at that time. This is a, a very common problem. And just to give you an idea, this was a survey of 1,200 ministers. Uh, only, only 300 responded, uh, questioning them about the extent of the problems, sexual contact, sexual contact in the ministerial relationship. And 39% of ministers responding said that they had a sexual contact with a church member. 13% had sexual intercourse with a church member. 76% of ministers knew of a minister who had had sexual intercourse with a church member. Now, in contrast, when they did a survey with therapists, only 5.5% said that they had sexual intercourse with a client. So clearly the problem is way bigger than it is among therapists. And then one of the issues is professional standards, which I'll get to in a few minutes. Survey of church workers. How many clergy women had experienced sexual harassment in the church? 77%. 20% laity had experienced sexual harassment in the church, and so on. So it's a common problem, and we and I, I maybe it's been a mistake to be to not talk about it openly for this many years, and it's time to do it again, and then we can see how much more we need to talk about it, uh, so we can all be educated. First, I want to uh, give some framing for this this whole uh, issue, and this framing comes largely out of the Faith Trust Institute uh, training. Usually, it's a three-day training, but they teach you how to do a one-day training and a one-hour training. <laughs> so I'm giving you the quick version tonight. But the framework is really helpful uh, because we just have a lot of misconceptions about this whole issue. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about dynamics, or in medicine we would call it etiology, how does this happen? Uh, recognizing when there's problems developing, Intervention, I won't talk about so much. That's, that's when an issue arises, but you can ask questions about that later if you want to. And prevention, I will talk about that. Next one. Okay, let's talk about boundaries first. So we're, we're going to talk about some terminology. So boundaries. Because we're talking about crossing boundaries, clergy crossing boundaries, we need to talk about boundaries. So are, are boundaries good or bad? Let's talk about in Zen. Or in spiritual practice, are boundaries good or bad? Good. Good. How are they good? What's good about them? Clarity. Sorry? Clarity. Clarity. They provide clarity about what? Behavior. About behavior, about how people should behave with each other. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. And hopefully, um, and the relationship between the boundaries and the discipline. The relationship between the boundaries and the discipline. Okay, good. We're going to talk about that. So boundaries actually provide some 
discipline or some framework in which the work can be done and needs to be done. Right. Now, what about then when we say, let go? Or dissolve yourself into the sound? Or become just the breath? Or let go of your ego, drop your ego? What about that? Not the same. Not the same. How? It's, it's, it's different when uh, you set boundaries and, and you cross them to expand. Uh -huh. And it's different when you put out boundaries that you not allow somebody to cross. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay, so here's an important difference. If we're, if one aspect of spiritual practice is that we, we do want to dissolve the armor of self, which is restricting us, and expand ourselves, as you said, step out into freedom, greater freedom, we can only do that in a safe framework, right? So boundaries can help create a safe container in which the work of dissolving boundaries can occur. This is a very important distinction, very, very important, because people get confused. And especially, I have to say, in the 1980s, <laughs> which was an era of boundaries are bad, don't be rigid, don't be jealous, open marriage, you know, free love, and etc. So there was a lot, a lot of confusion at that time, but there still is confusion. That boundaries have a sort of negative implication of rigidity or guardedness or ego defense. So we have to be very careful about what we're talking about. So let's just let's just look at this. You can fill in the next. So confusion over the value of boundaries. This is the sort of thing that you hear typically in Zen practice or spiritual practice, mystical practice. But the value of boundaries is they provide a, a framework of safety in which we can do this very important work. It's like traffic lanes. So when you drive down the freeway, you want traffic lanes. You want people to observe the dotted lines, the boundaries of the dotted lines. Otherwise, it's chaos, and people get killed. And, and you have traffic pileups. And the same thing can happen in spiritual practice. If there aren't clear boundaries, <coughs> professional boundaries, containers like sashim, containers like our ethical guidelines in our sangha, then pileups can occur and people can be damaged. So boundaries also allow people to seek help from spiritual te teachers without having to worry about the teacher's needs. Now we're going to address this several other times. So there's a, a professional obligation to meet the needs of the person you're serving and not to have the person you're serving take care of your needs. And then boundaries create a container of trust. And trust is very important. People often ask us why Sashin has so many rules. It's because we're creating a container of safety that people can trust and predict this is what's going to happen. And that they won't be touched and people won't come up and talk to them suddenly. And they can do the work that they need to do within their own being with the support, the silent support of everybody else in the session. But people aren't going to come up suddenly and, 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 and violate boundaries. Amen. So next we need to talk a little bit about uh, sexual behavior. So just to review on, on boundaries, boundaries make uh, the work effective, the spiritual work effective, clear boundaries. And the spiritual work is in dissolving boundaries. So we have these two issues we have to, we have to balance. And boundaries prevent suffering that result from boundary crossing, when people inappropriately cross boundaries. So now we need to talk a little bit about sexuality because many people who've been raised in a Judeo-Christian context have uh, a, a, a leftover feeling of somehow sexuality is bad. Sexuality is just energy. Sexual energy is just energy. And we do, I think we'll try to do this year or next year, um, the, the series of classes on sexuality in spiritual practices, as spiritual practice. So sexuality is neither good nor bad. 
Sexuality is inherent in being a human being. None of us would be here if it weren't for sexual energy, right? Sexual energy can create intimacy when it's used properly. Sexual energy communicates sexual interest. But when sexual energy is put out, and we'll talk about how it's put out, it can be perceived very differently by different people. So if Joe puts out sexual energy to four different women, depending on their backgrounds and their histories, their conditioning, we could say, um, their filters, we could say, they're going to perceive that very differently. So we, in spiritual practice, take responsibility for the energy that we put out. So we're watching how is that received, how is that perceived. That's part of our responsibility, and it's definitely part of the responsibility of a professional. So, to, so we, we don't abdicate responsibility by saying, well, that's just how they perceived it. I didn't mean it that way. We have to be aware of other people. But sexual behavior is also ethically neutral. It's neither good nor bad. It's not appropriate or inappropriate, wholesome or unwholesome. It is just sexual energy. But in certain contexts, it can be misused, and it can be very inappropriate. So when there's an imbalance of power, or when one person's choice is not respected. We're going to talk about power and balance of power and imbalance. But this is a key concept. I, I've worked for over 25 years in the field of sexual abuse and domestic violence. And one of the questions that comes up commonly is, well, if two kids are doing sexual play, is that, when is that sexual abuse? When do you need to be concerned? So we look, or if two, let's say a teenager, a 15-year-old, uh, gets involved in sexual activity, when do you intervene in that? And one of the issues is, is there an imbalance in age, which implies an imbalance in power? So we generally say if there's an age difference of more than two to three years between the children, there's automatically an imbalance in power. If one child has disabilities or mental deficiency, then there's an imbalance in power. And a 15-year-old, if she's dating a 16-year-old, that's fairly balanced, probably. But if she's dating a 29-year-old, that's not balanced. That's the sort of thing we're looking at all the time, that balance of power and knowledge and experience uh, in, in my field. So let's look at sexualized behavior. What is sexualized behavior? This is some of, some of what we do in the workshop on, on sexuality and, and as spiritual practice. So what would be examples of verbal sexualized behavior, behavior that is made on purpose, given charge with sexual energy? 